I do not mean to be mean. I do mean to be mad. You obey your pastor. If you ain't got the King James, you ain't got... Hey, if you don't have a King James, you don't have a Bible. I still believe if you're cold day in hell before I get my family from a woman, I'm a preacher. The young preachers that do love God get pulled off into Calvinism. And I'll fight it, I'll fight it. I'll fight you in the parking lot over it. I'll get personal with you. When you got dressed today, you dressed deity. This is the For Freedom Podcast. A podcast that is part of the RFP Network that seeks to bring freedom in Christ from the spiritual abuse of legalism in the independent fundamental Baptist movement. Now here are your hosts, John Hollyfield and James Saifert. And so fundamentalism is designed to uh, unpack the idea of authority from Scripture. The problem with that is that that's not the defining principle in Scripture. It is a part of Scripture, but the defining principle in Scripture is love. saying that all men who sit under the, uh, that teaching will become abusive, but what I'm saying is the ones who are abusive will be drawn to that sort of teaching. I don't want to give people just a list of things they can start doing differently until they have a heart out of which they're going to be doing those things differently. Bitterness is different from hurt. I would say that hurt or even abuse does not have to result in bitterness. Welcome everybody back to the For Freedom Podcast. This is a For Freedom Podcast where we declare freedom from the spiritual abuse of legalism. I'm back in the chair. James is in the chair in North Carolina. My co-host James Saver. What's going on, James? Man, I'm doing good. Glad to be here. Glad to be in North Carolina, and next week at this time, John, I will be in uh, Texas, and John's going to be in the great state of North Carolina. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be in North He's Carolina. Gonna be here. We're going to flip the script a little bit, yeah. and I'm going to be gone. John, 58 episodes in, who would have thought after 58, almost touching 60 year, that we'd still be talking in a microphone and people would still be listening? Yeah, who would have thought that our microphones would even work? Yeah, we've we've had a little bit of technical difficulties this yeah, morning. Yeah, if I feel like I'm on edge or I'm a little, if I get a little tense this morning, it's because I'm already like my blood pressure is up because of this stinking microphone for no reason would not work for at least twenty minutes, and then it just started working. It worked, <laughs> and That's we have no idea why. <laughs> Do not know why. This is the magic mm. of podcasting, everybody. If somebody right. thinks that they know what they're doing, they're full of it. You don't. They, they don't. Yeah, a couple of announcements, John. We got coming up. Uh, starting in January, uh, the power of the story will be coming out a new RFP Network podcast, and uh, you can find that information on the RFP Network dot org, and you can go to that website and yeah. uh, you'll be yeah. able to submit your story, submit your audio recording, and they'll put it on there. It'll be a yeah, cool. I think this is going to be a good addition to the to the network, and I think people are going to enjoy it. I think it'll be um, it'll be helpful and also. Um, powerful, I think, to hear different people's perspectives, different people's journeys. And uh, also, I think it's going to be digestible, too. I don't think it's going to be, like, incredibly long form. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. The next one is uh, there's it's an announcement about an announcement because right. there's a big announcement coming. B -b 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 Black Friday. Yes, next Friday. Next Friday, you're going to get the big announcement from the RFP guys. And uh, me and John, we're trying to figure out how we're going to do that uh, because we're not going to be recording next week. This will be our last episode for the year, uh, episode 58, and we're going to take our holiday break as we've done in the past. And so we're going to take November and December, or I'm sorry, the rest of December 
uh, and spend with our families. Uh, we'll be traveling. We'll be going back and forth from different places. And so we're going to take that time to rethink through some things and uh, be able to reprocess, reset our brains a little bit and uh, be able to process some things going forward. And so we're excited about that, excited about being able to spend time with our families yeah. and with um, our loved ones. Yeah, the holidays are always a busy time for me, and it's a time where I like to um, to like just sort of unplug in some things, take a, take a step back and, and think about the next year coming up, do some planning. So that normally starts for me at Thanksgiving. Uh, we, we get to go home, spend some time with my family for a week at Thanksgiving. And uh, I like to plan for the next year, do some church planning and that kind of thing. And then when we get back for December, you say, well, I know episodes in December. Well, December is just a crazy month for me. I don't know about James, but it's a crazy month for me because there's there's about up to 100 Christmas parties. And again, it's it's something to sort of uh, take a breather before January kicks in because I like to hit January, you know, just hit it running, hit it hard yeah, with new goals and new, new uh, things. And so, um, you know, and plus, you know, focus more time, like any extra time, if I can get work done earlier, you know, spend, spend some extra time with family instead of, you know, other projects got going on. So, um, so yeah, we're going to take a break and starting next week, this will be the last episode of the year. Uh, and then, so we'll have Thanksgiving and then for the month of December, we're going to be off and then January will be coming back. We actually are going to be recording two episodes in December that'll start us off and kick us off, uh, uh, in January that we're extremely looking forward to. These are going to be really good topics and good guests. So we're looking forward to what we're going to be doing uh, next year. And so look for us then. But, um, you know, we'll be around. And uh, so this, I guess, James, um, what do you do for, what, what, what's your plan? You said you're going to Texas for Thanksgiving? Yeah, I'm leaving for Texas uh, Monday. So when this comes out on Thursday, uh, I'll be heading to Texas. My sister's out there. And my in-laws will be doing something out there as well in the town beside where my sister lives. And so we're flying out Monday. We'll be back on Friday, back to North Carolina. And then, I mean, in Christmas, like you said, December, uh, almost every weekend we have something going on. Uh, every Sunday in December we have something going on. And then we're taking our young people, our teenagers, to Gatlinburg uh, for a winter retreat. And uh, it's going to be an exciting time for that. And so we will be... Um, you know, spending the week uh, there over the new year in Gatlinburg. We've got a cabin, and uh, it'll be a wonderful, wonderful time. Well, this brings us to our uh, subject for today, and we wanted to cover this subject because we think that it's probably something we should have covered a long time ago. Yeah. We just never dove into it, and it sort of seems to be something that's come up in the— in the forefront of the RFP family and the community page and just some conversations about it, some different things going on. And uh, we figured we wanted to take it. We, you know, we, we sort of have been shifting our focus on our podcast to more of a counseling based uh, avenue type of things and, and giving help in that way. And so we're going to talk about deconstruction today, deconstruction and, and particularly more specific what should a Christian's view of deconstruction be? And maybe how can we help with that? And that kind of thing. So, um, James, will you got any thoughts as we, we jump into this subject today? Well, you know, I think everyone, if you want to use the term deconstruction, I don't think we really like the term that deconstruction. I think but the better term would be reconstruction and refiguring out how things fit together. Uh, but I think we all go through this at, at some point in our life when we begin to be adults. Uh, you know, when you begin to um, make decisions for yourself, when you begin to make a family, uh, you begin to reevaluate everything. And this is an ongoing process, I think, uh, in your life as you begin to develop what you believe, why you believe it. I think what the RFP guy said this last week is we said something a month ago we may not agree with today because Scripture is always helping us have a better understanding of our life. And uh, so it's always good to reevaluate and look at things. And so that is what we're going to be talking about today, deconstruction or a Christian's view of deconstruction. Yeah, and I think that get get it going that we first need to define the term, define the term deconstruction. So yeah. deconstruction is um, taking apart, of the taking apart of an idea, practice, tradition, belief, or system into smaller components in order to examine their foundation, truthfulness, usefulness, 
and impact. All right, so this was taken from a website that I found, and they then uh, quote Rachel Held Evans, who sort of looked at it like this when she said in her book, Searching for Sunday, um, it is taking a massive inventory of your faith, tearing every doctrine from the cupboard, and turning each one over in your hand. Now, I don't think James and I would particularly agree with Rachel Held Evans. Now, I'm not saying that we wouldn't agree with her definition of what deconstruction is as far as defining it. I don't think we would necessarily agree with her conclusions on things at all. Uh, Elisa Childers is one that, uh, that, that I don't think would agree with it as well, and she goes on to define it as deconstruction is the process of systematically dissecting and often rejecting the beliefs you grew up with. Now, is there a difference between the way Lisa Childers defined deconstruction and the way that Rachel Hild Evans defined deconstruction? Well, just by their word definitions, yes, there is. I mean, let's look at that definition again by, by Rachel Hild Evans, James. It is a massive inventory of your faith, tearing every doctrine from the cupboard and turning each one over in your hand. Now, on its surface, without any exposition of that, just looking at that definition— James, do you think we would come to any disagreement with that? You th- well, do you think that we would we would have a problem with someone doing that? Like taking their the doctrines and the things that they believe, pulling them apart one by one, and then mulling over it and going back over it and seeing if it stands up to Scripture. Would, yeah, we, would I, we agree with that? I, I don't think I have a problem with that at all because I think that that's what we've done in our, in our past. We've talked about it in depth if you've listened to our – um, our, our history of even coming out of the independent fundamental Baptist world, uh, and specifically for myself, the King James only issue, uh, taking that issue, spending three years really mulling it over, looking it over, listening to other arguments and debates, and officially coming to a decision for myself. Yeah. Um, uh, that is that's basically if you take that at face value, that's what she's saying. Yeah, take every doctrine, every standard, every legalism, everything that's said, and let's mull it over. Okay, so here's the issue, and I think Elisa Childers gets at it when she writes about this and the way she defines it. The way that they define deconstruction and the way that they go about practicing deconstruction aren't necessarily the same thing. And so whenever you see people that are promoting this deconstruction movement, and helping people through their deconstruction, it actually doesn't hold up to the definition that Rachel Held Evans is. It comes down to actually the way Alyssa Childers has defined it, and that is deconstruction is the process of systematically dissecting and often rejecting the beliefs you grew up with. Mm-hmm. All right? Throwing everything out. Start I, think of it, I, I think of my kids like Legos, and if I'm honest— I enjoy playing with Legos as well. (laughs) Whatever. I'm like, hey, you got a new Lego set. All right, let Daddy build it for you. (laughs) Okay. But I think of it like, imagine you have a massive Lego tower built, right? And you've built this tower. It's sitting there. And so deconstruction is sort of like this. You're taking one block, one block, one block, one block, and you're tearing down instead of like, you know, just kicking the Lego tower over. You're taking it one block at a time and pulling the Lego tower apart until there is no Lego tower back uh, there anymore. And then the idea is to try to build it back up. Now, here is the, the, the problem. Most deconstruction, coaches, movement, whatever it goes, they pull the Lego tower apart and then they pull the base out. And then they're saying... Now, you figure out what you want to do. There's really no putting it back together. Mm -hmm. It's just taking it apart. There is no putting it back together. But here's the problem for Christians. Here's the problem for us. And especially, James has already talked about it. We went through our own sort of taking apart this idea of where we believe and reexamining those types of things. And we're going to present sort of a different way of looking at this and a different term to use because we don't believe deconstruction is, number one, the best term to use, we also don't think is how it's viewed and it's defined is actually accurate to what believers do. Okay? Yeah. First Thessalonians 5.21 says, Test everything. Hold fast to that which is good. Does that mean tear down everything? No. 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 We're supposed to test everything and hold fast to what is good. 
So we test it all, that which is bad we discard, that which is good we hold fast to. But this idea of tearing it down is not necessarily the accurate view of what we're talking about here. All right? Yeah. Uh, James, go ahead with the next thing. Yeah, the purpose is to tear down everything and then rebuild it back. And what should be kept and disregarded is that which is wrong or harmful. Uh, the problem is many times those who do this, uh, the way of movement is viewed is that the foundation or God's word must also be completely taken down, tore down, and torn apart as well. And saying, okay, is God's word even correct? And and, and I, we need to ask ourselves that question. We need to be very dogmatic with what we believe about God's word. But when you begin to rip apart God's word and then you begin to get to the point I'm not going to mention the pastor's name, but you may know it. When you begin to throw out the Old Testament and say, we've got to unhitch ourselves from it, all of a sudden, now you've completely taken what, well, if this one thing is wrong, I've got to get everything out. I've got to, you know, they don't understand the, the validity of Scripture and uh, the what it's written to or who it's written about during those different times. And so they just say, well, we just got to get rid of the whole thing. Yeah, I'm all about going. Yeah, I'm all about going back and studying bibliology and studying why you believe the Bible is the Bible and why it's the Word of God. Studying the canonicity of Scripture and getting into those aspects of it. But when we tear down even the foundation, you can't build back. I mean, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, you got a house. Try building a house without setting a foundation. It ain't gonna work well. It ain't gonna work. There was people that that did it down the road from us. They built this house. It's like this quick build for a rental house, and they 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 threw it up as quick as they could, and didn't really pull all the permits they needed to. And then they even got it completed and got a person in there. The person started. The renters started complaining about some things, and the renter did not do anything about it. So they actually called the county. County inspector came over there and examined it and said, "We never examined this house." And he said, I think I see why. He said, there's having, they were already having structural problems with the house. And then he went over there and examined the foundation and noticed that the foundation was completely wrong. So you know what the county made them do? Tear the whole thing down. They had to take the house down and repair the foundation, and then they could fill it back. Yeah. And that's what they did. You know, because you have to have the foundation. So here's what, I, and this is going to be controversial. This may be, uh, there's going to be some people who won't like this at all. But to deconstruct something without an established foundation, Mm -hmm. such as God's word, is the height of folly. Yeah. You got to have something to build on. Yeah. You got to have something to build on. Tom Sujimura, Tom Sujimura. Uh, is a biblical counselor and ACBC fellow, and he wrote an article sort of about this that James and I read in preparation for this, and he said this in quote. He says, Biblical truth should remain our standard for discernment. And he quotes Psalms 19, 7 through 9, and I'm going to go back and quote that after I finish this quote. He said, Biblical truth should remain our standard for discernment. You cannot rebuild if you tear down the foundation along with the house. So look at what Psalm 19, 7 through 9 says. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. God's word is complete and perfect and suitable for that foundation. It yeah. does all these things. It is perfect. It is true. It's sure. It's righteous. We eliminate that from your deconstruction. Your end result is not going to be done well. Yeah. And I think he lays out some great principles to help us out with this. Um, he lays out how how and what we can do to help. Um, And then he really, I think the best part of this whole article is what we're going to talk about at the end is some of the answers uh, for those who are experiencing church hurt. Um, And I think that's where we can, we can help out today. You know, know, uh, I I guess the question, the thing, the the question to ask of this whole thing, like if you're starting to re-examine your faith, that's fine. If you're examining what you've believed, that kind of thing. Remember first Thessalonians 5, 21 test, test it. 
Hold fast to what is good. Test mm-hmm. those things. We're not dis- discouraging that. We're discouraging tearing apart down even the foundation and then trying to go back. I, you know, James, I just finished this past Sunday. This year I've preached through the book of Judges at our church. And you know what the theme in the book of Judges is? It's actually recorded in the final verse, but it's recorded many other times in the, in the book. It's recorded in the final verse of the book of Judges. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Yep. And everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. Mm-hmm. All right, so, so check this out. When it says that there was no king in Israel, it was establishing a fact that they were supposed to be judging themselves and there wasn't a king. But it also carried with it this idea. Who was actually supposed to be their king during that time period? It was supposed to be Yahweh. It was supposed to be God. And whenever it made the claim that there was no king in Israel, it meant that they had left regarding God as their king. So therefore, they were doing that which was right in their own eyes. The book of Judges is one of the hardest books to read because the book of Judges has some of the most atrocious stories in it. And that is the result of people doing what's right in your own eyes. Why do I say this? Because when you do this deconstruction thing and you leave out the foundation of God's word, the best you're leaving yourself with is doing what's right in your own eyes, and that will never get you anywhere good. Mm, It will never get you anywhere healthy. All right? So going back to what James was saying, Tom Sujimura in this article asked the question, what lies at the heart for those who are going through deconstruction? So we want to be kind. We, listen, we want to be, we're not trying to be as attacking. We're not trying to be, um, I know I'm worked up. It's probably mm-hmm. mainly because of this microphone issue. <laughs> but yeah. um, but we, we actually want to come at this with a very huge concern and care and heart for those who are asking, feeling like this statement right here. They learn something new, and they feel like, I feel like I've been lied to my entire life about what I believe. Yeah. We were there. I was at that point. James has been at that point. So that's what we're speaking to, and we care for that, and we have a concern for you. But we also want to try to warn you and help you from this trap. Yeah. This day. Well, and, and even when I was going through this article and, and studying for this this talk today, Man, there was so much in just this first part, these five points that he lays out, that as I read it, my mind went to, oh, man, I was there. Oh, man, I I did that because of that reason. Like, that's one of the reasons I was doing what I was doing, and I was saying what I was saying, and I was acting the way I was acting because of that specific reason. And uh, I think it's it's good to identify those things. It's good for us to uh, understand what those are so that we can not – because – Guys, it's so it's so hard because when we have been in the world of one of these specific situations, we begin to fall in those same pitfalls later on. Whether it's people pleasing, whether it's whatever, we begin to want to please another person. And all of a sudden, we're in the same trap that we were in 10 years ago when we wanted to leave legalism, and now we're back in that same trap. Mm. We're, you know, That's good. I've, said, I've said this in private, and I don't know if I should even say it in public. But all of a sudden, we can attack the IFB all we want, but when we attack uh, someone or something that we like, all of a sudden, everyone gets mad. And well, it's everyone, not even attacking. It's pointing out. It, pointing out, yeah. yeah, yeah it, it, we point out something that is wrong or that is not biblical, and it's like, wait a second, you can't do that. Yeah. But they tend to neglect that just about every letter of the New Testament that Paul wrote was actually to correct some major error of teaching that had worked its way into the church. Yeah. Exactly. Anyways, anyways, we so let's jump to these five. I'll go through the first one, and we'll just sort of go back and forth. First one that it says here is, and sorry if my mic is popping again. Uh, the first one is personal suffering. A way that you would deconstruct or reconstruct your faith would be a, a suffering that has happened personally to you or to your family, uh, something that uh, triggered or you know a, a type of abuse. This could be from physical abuse, verbal abuse, uh, even a emotional abuse from the pulpit from the pastor himself in the context of the church okay let's look at the church because that's what we're looking at uh and all of a sudden when those things were done or an idol that you looked at uh, or someone that you held to a higher standard and all of a sudden they fall well now your faith is falling with that person because you have lifted this person up above what they should have done and that suffering happens and you begin to say 
if they could fall and they're my hero, what is my faith even about? Yeah, so this personal, so this is like, why Why are you in this point? Of, this is what we're talking about. Why are you in this position? Why are you even considering deconstruction? We're talking to you now. We're talking to that person who is who is thinking, all right, I'm deconstructing or something like that. All right, why do you get in, why do people get in these, these situations? Because of personal suffering? You know, like James talked about, you've been spiritually abused, and now you're looking at it, you've been hurt. All you've seen in the church is nothing but bad stuff. Yeah. And so you're looking at this like, should I use it? But, and we're not getting to the solution, but I think this needs to be said, especially in light of conversations that have been going around recently. Be careful to make grand statements mm-hmm. about things such as the church as a whole based on your personal limited experience. It's very easy to categorize something when you have not experienced or been around the entire body of Christendom. We're talking about a body of Christ that's been around for 2,000 years that has existed across several countries. And because you've experienced hurt and suffering in just a few churches in your limited years of lifetime, you think that the whole thing should be written off? I'm not, listen, I'm not trying to be unkind, I'm not trying to be in, uh, uh, cruel. But I'm saying, I, I, I get it. I get it. But we have to be careful of not thinking too much of our own situations. Listen, I highly recommend this book, if you're watching on YouTube, The Subtle Power of Spiritual Abuse by Dave Johnson and Van Fonderen. And he says, they say this in, in chapter 18, that it's pretty hard. To take, but you got to listen to it. We have forgotten that preoccupation with self in the name of God is still preoccupation with self. Mm-hmm. We need to be careful not to step into that trap of lumping everything all together. It, is there some major problems in church culture? Oh, absolutely. Sort of why we're doing this podcast. <laughs> because we're not talking about abuse in the secular world. We're talking about abuse in the church, aren't we, James? Yeah, exactly. We're trying to offer help to those who've been abused in the church. We're recognizing that problem exists, but it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with faith or mm-hmm. God. It means that there's something wrong with people Yeah, because we're I sinners. Mean, and, man, you look at this, and I just got back from our North Carolina convention and uh, the the whole— pastors conference they did was on the disciples and each pastor that got up there were seven of them talked about seven different disciples and one of them got the honor of talking about judas iscariot and first message i'd ever heard in my entire life a complete message about judas iscariot and you're talking about a guy who turned in the savior who all you know you know the story but then all of a sudden the guy said i fully believe if Judas would have turned and went to the cross and said, Jesus, I'm sorry, he would have been forgiven. But he chose to live in the mistakes that he made. He said, Peter denied Jesus, did everything outside of turn him in. He denied him and, and sinned and did everything, but still turned and went to Jesus, and Jesus forgave him. We've got to get to this point where we begin to look to Jesus, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, and turn to him in everything we go through. There's going to be pot, there's going to be pain, there's going to be suffering, there's going to be trials we go through. Where's our focus at? Mm-hmm. If our focus is on a man, a man's going to fall. If our focus is on a church, a church is going to fall. If our focus is on a group of people, if your focus is on your family, your family's going to fail you. Been listening through some of our counsel and stuff, and uh, Jim Newhouser, who we had on a couple weeks ago, had mentioned how uh, some of his biggest trials were when his adult children began to turn away from the faith and it destroyed him because as a man who loves God and who tries to raise children right, they turned away from their faith. He said that was hard for him, but he had to turn to Jesus. He had to turn to where he was supposed to look at. And I think that's where we get our our eyes off of Jesus when this suffering happens. And it's very, very hard for us to to build back. We totally just like jumped ahead on the first point of the thing. Sorry. 
But but I think that that aspect of the personal suffering needed to be talked about. But James, why don't you go ahead? We're talking about why do those um, who, what lies at the heart of those who are going through dis- deconstruction? There were five things. Yeah, James, we hit the first one: personal suffering. James, why don't you just go ahead and run through the the two through five, and then we'll get into um, things that can help them. Okay, people pleasing uh, in their desire for approval of others, they fall away from the church and embrace the culture's values. So they began to, uh, they were people pleasing at one point, and now that person has fallen or something has happened, and they've they've walked away. Pride is number three. Uh, they began to say that, uh, that their pride gets in the way, and so they just abandon everything. Popularity, social media celebrates those who take extreme positions more than those who uphold traditional beliefs. And this is huge in our day and age right now with, Popularity, it's, it's popular to leave loud. It's popular to, when you leave an organization or when you leave something, you make this big grand statement that you're leaving. Um, it, it can be helpful. It can be hurtful in a lot of ways. And then pleasure, those who abandon their faith in order to excuse moral wrongdoings. Yeah. So so these are just some five practical ways that he lays out so we're, why yeah. people would do that. So we're talking about this article called The Heart of Deconstruction by Tom Suchimura. He's a, he's a pastor and a biblical counselor. And so he answers back. So those are the problems. He answers back with three things. And so James, are gonna, James and I are going to take his three points, and we're going to talk about these, and then we'll be done. Because I think that these, I think he hits it right here with these three things, because uh, I think, he's, I think this, is, this is it. This is what uh, we have to have going forward. And so James already actually sort of hit the first um, first sorry. one, which is we must fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews twelve two, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. I guess the question needs to should you need to ask yourself, you need to search your heart and ask yourself, who is the beginner of your faith? Is it the church? Is it the pastor? Is it somebody within the church? Is it a family member? Or is it Jesus? Who is the author and finisher of your faith? Fix your eyes on Christ. And that's some of the things that I feel like people this this this, this discussion of someone leaving the faith, you know what I didn't get at all, I didn't hear anything at all, is problems with Jesus. Yeah. Problems with Jesus. You know, James, I I asked myself one time, if I was the last believer on planet Earth, Mm. if everybody fell away, or if everybody just abandoned the faith, or if everybody was, like, is my faith you know, in Christ so much that I could maintain following Christ if it was just me. Yeah. That's that's big. That's a big question, John. I know, but I think that you need to ask, you need to search your heart for that because if you're not, I think ready to answer that, I think you then need to ask this question. So what are you putting your faith in? If not Christ? Yeah. And if you're putting your faith in the legitimacy of of other people and the way you think they should be behaving, you may have something out of balance. I know that's 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 difficult, but we have to have to have to have to have to fix our eyes on Jesus. Yeah, and that's so it's so important to think about that and to reevaluate really where we're at and say, what am I focusing on? What am I allowing my eyes to be fixed on? And, uh, you know, we've, we, unfortunately, John, we've been a, we've been a part of several people in our lives that we looked up to that have fallen in sin and had messed up and screwed up. Um, uh, your brother, my best friend, he was the best man in my wedding. Was he the best man in your wedding? I mean, we, yeah. we, we, we've got people that I worked with, uh, pastors that are, very influential in our life they've they've fallen men outside of the ministry who have fallen men who were lay people in our church growing up have fallen women who have fallen and and 
made mistakes and caused crimes and, and the, not just sexual immorality, but other things as well. And we've got to understand when we get back to the point where we are completely depraved, we are sinners, we're going to make mistakes, but there is someone that is sinless. There is someone who, when we fix our eyes on them, they're not going to fail us. They're not going to, they're not going to fall away. They're not going to, uh, recruits their faith and, and go somewhere else, but they're seated at the right hand of God. They're making intercession for us daily. This man named Jesus, who we can focus our eyes on. And when we do that, man, we are able to do what he says because he endured the cross, despising the same, and is now seated there. And when we can get our eyes on Jesus and get our eyes off of the world that we know is wicked. We know is full of sin that is going to fail us. Get our eyes back on Jesus. Allow that to be our foundation and grow from there. Yeah, and that must be, you know, I like how this is ordered because you can't get to number two if you haven't got number one. Exactly. Number two, he writes, we must find a place to belong in our local church. Say, so, whoa, 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 the church is where I was hurt. No, 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 no. That's number two. Number one is fix your eyes on Jesus. Listen, if that's an issue— we're not telling you to do this yet. We got to get you. We got to get you. Get your eyes fixed on Jesus. You get your eyes fixed on Jesus. Then we need you. You you need to be. Listen. I think for a lot of people, James. I think they've never experienced what a healthy church is like. Yeah. They right. have no frame of reference for what a healthy church is like. And can I just tell you this? Can I? If you're listening today. I know it's hard to believe, and I know you've struggled because you've visited some even after leaving your your legalistic church, and you're trying to find one, and you just it's just it doesn't seem to be. There are healthy churches yeah. out there. There are churches where pastors and elders do not try to take as much power as they can. There are churches out there where the pastors and the elders recognize that their responsibility is to serve. As a shepherd, yeah. the congregation, and not lord over them. There are churches where people recognize that as the pastor and the elders are serving them, they serve each other and practice the one another's of the New Testament. And yeah. so you get in there, and they're not looking to, to use you for anything. They just want to see you be able to use your gift for Christ. Listen, I'm telling you, there are congregations out there like that. Mm -hmm. And so it is essential for you to get plugged in and belong to a local church yeah. because there, I do believe, yes, we have messed things up as men. We have messed things up as sinners, but I do believe that what Jesus, what was recorded in Acts chapter two, 42 through 47 can be experienced today in a local church. You mean read that John? Yeah. Read that. And they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and of prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belonging and distributing the proceeds to all as, as many as had need. And day by day, attending to the temple together and breaking bread in their homes and receiving food with gladness and generous of heart praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It's so powerful, John. It's so... Yes, I've been a part of unhealthy churches. Yes, I've been a part of abusive churches. Churches that you can go back in whatever episode it was where I shared my story. And you can hear where leadership abused and abused their power and uh, abused even work life and uh, the time wise and we invested more than what we should have and uh, you can hear all those things but when you get to the place where you are grounded in a gospel centered gospel believing church who practices what that just read all things in common the gospel living a more holy, sanctified life, growing closer and closer with one another, breaking bread to daily together, enjoying each other's company, enjoying each other's fellowship, ultimately, John, keeping each other accountable. Yep. 
we go through hard times as pastors. We don't have a lot of people to talk to, uh, and situations are going on in our churches. And man, I'm able to talk to John even yesterday. Talked to him, and some things were going on here at the church. And this was John's question to me, and it really I had I stopped the vehicle when he asked me this. He said, "James, are you all right? Everything okay with you?" And and that for me was so beneficial because someone else cared about how I was taking and processing what was going on at the church. And so many times that gets overlooked, but that's what healthy churches are. That's what healthy people are about is making sure that each other is taken care of and each other is not forsaken. Yeah, I know we need to move on, but I'm going to, I'm going to toss something out. Here's a scenario and I'm not bragging on on myself or anything like that. I just, I just want to show you something because this is this took years for us to get to. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw a scenario out there that might blow some of your minds, and some of you that's experienced a healthy church, you're like, yes, yes, yes. So we had a small group at our house Sunday night, and we're doing a small group curriculum on the church, and the the lesson that night was actually on church discipline. So here we are afterwards having a small group discussion. I am the pastor leading the small group discussion with with church members. Okay, so, so adults here talking about this and we're ironing out some questions about church discipline and we had agreement on just about everything there and i was like okay we're done our time is up i said but i got one sort of sort of angle that we could throw out here about church discipline that may be debated and and something that uh we could have some disagreement on if you guys want to do that and they were like yes let's do it so i threw out this idea and here i am as the senior pastor listening to church members disagree and I'm disagreeing with them, and you know what? We're laughing and having a good time, and nobody's upset. Yeah. And they have this comfort that they're okay disagreeing with me about an aspect of where we draw the line on something or where we, you know, just sort of cut the angle, and they're okay with it. And, you know, one of the things, the last things I said to them is, like, if you guys are okay to have a little bit of grace with me that— I'm not there where you're at with that thing, and we could just go on. Because we probably, it was like a hypothetical scenario. It's like, we're probably never going to see this. Yeah. But listen, that's what we're talking about. Now, we talked about fixing your eyes on Jesus, mm-hmm. getting plugged in and belonging to a local church. Number three, we must affirm Scripture as God's living and active word. I, I yeah. think I, I, I'm so grateful that Tom wrote this in his article because Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. I know a lot of people hear that verse and are like, it's a two-edged sword, and they go back to their scripture memory and all this, but I want you to lean in on the end of that verse. It discerns. Mm-hmm. The thoughts and intentions of the heart. Listen, if you're going through a, de- a deconstruction, if you're experiencing those things, the Word of God is precisely what you need. Yeah. Because there's nothing else that can discern the thoughts and intentions of your sinful heart like God's Word can. Yeah, John, even in, as part of the, the things that we went through, uh, f- one of the things that maybe I'm the only one that did this when— when there was an issue that was uh, difficult to process or difficult to even think about, I went and I studied scripture to see what scripture said about that issue. Women wearing pants, music I should listen to. It wasn't, let me go see what Dr. Hollyfield has to say about it. It was, because <laughs> he's a doctor now, he's got his honorary doctor from the RFP. It was, what does the word of God say about it? Okay, it was. it was, what did... What does God's word say and how does he command me? What did Jesus say about these issues? Those are the things that are going to help us when we go through this discovery, reconstruction, deconstruction process because we're going back to God's word and saying, God, what is it? I don't I, forget what your Bible college said. Forget what your childhood pastor said. Forget all those things. What does God's word say about it? That's the foundation and that is where we're going to get the answers that we need. Yeah, no, I totally agree. You know, I think what you need, if you're experiencing this, I think what you need is what Romans 12, 1 and 2 explains. Exactly. You need the renewing of your mind. Yeah. 
you need the renewing of your mind because your mind is in a thousand different places. You're feeling like you've been lied to, and you need the renewing of your mind. What is the instrument that is able to renew your mind? It's God's Word. Yeah. It's God's Word. You need to go to that. You know, and I think that uh, there's a lot of scripture that's been distorted. So maybe having someone hold your hand and walk you through some of these things, bringing some of these questions up. Uh, you know, I know this is this delicate subject because a lot of times the word of God was the weapon that was used against you to abuse you. But understanding that it's the only tool that can also correct those things of accurately understanding it of looking back at some of those passages. Just, listen, you go through, if you read this book, The Subtle Power of Spiritual Abuse, you know what they do all through the book? They go back and correct misused passages and use Jesus' teaching from the Gospels to, for, for basic, that's, that's how they help you. Mm. They're leaning into God's Word for that help, and that's what you need. You need yeah. somebody to take God's Word. So when we look at this, we, we this is our sum up, James. Our sum up for how we view this concept. We don't call it deconstruction. This is how we view it. Do you want me to? Yeah, go ahead, man. Oh, Read sorry. It. Setting yeah. you up. That was a good right. setup. Hey, I didn't know. Okay. We view it as a spiritual reformation over deconstruction because many will demolish the true faith instead of stopping at human traditions. Jesus warned that shuts tearing down will actually result in our physical, de our spiritual deconstruction. Uh, John, if I've been studying through Colossians and being able to preach through that, Colossians 2 talks about how we should get away from the traditions of man. The traditions of man and the things that man teach are going to hold us back. We've got to realign ourselves with what God has for us. If you want to read through Colossians 2, be one and two will both give you some great things there. Uh, but those are the things that they say in here is the, get rid of the, the demolishing of the human traditions, but really getting back to the moment where what is spiritual reformation? What is this goal of our entire life is to glorify God and to draw all men to him. Yeah. And so that is that's sort of where we're at. Matthew seven twenty six. John, why don't you read that? And, Matthew uh, seven twenty six says, And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Verse 27, And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. What is this? This is the result of what happens when you are trying to rebuild without the foundation of God's word. Yeah. The rains come, the storms come, the wind blows, and great was the fall of it. I asked Nathan Cravat a couple weeks ago. I said, is the RFP movement a deconstruction movement? You know what his response was? Heck no, with many exclamation points. And he said no. And his reply was, it's a reformation movement, and I am 100% in agreement. We are talking about reformation, not deconstruction. Reformation. And I just want to give a thanks to Tom Sujimura, who, um, and I hope I'm saying your name right. I don't know if Tom will ever listen to this. I hope that we, <laughs> you know, gave you credit enough for this material. Uh, we thank you for the article. We're going to link the article in the show notes because I think it's it's very helpful. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I hope this was beneficial and uh if we just uh triggered many of you and made you upset then come at us we got a couple weeks off so we'll just take it yeah we don't care that's right and john is our content curator so anything you put on social media he's gonna see so he can he can be the one that you can go <laughs> after yes 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 james you got any closing comments well, john i'm gonna miss these Next couple of weeks, not getting together and putting some things out, but I am looking forward to uh, some vacation time, some time to get away from my family, and uh, get away from your family or get away with your family. Both, <laughs> both from some family getting to some family. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Uh, but I, I'm excited, and uh, guys, I hope this has been a help to you. Um, I hope 
if if we said anything that wasn't biblical and that hurts your feelings and we're in the wrong but if it was biblical and it hurts your feelings or if you're upset right now don't come at us go at the bible mm. because a lot of what we told you was from god's word and but we want to hear your comments if you if you have it if you're upset at what we said if you're upset at how we said it maybe our tone we tried being very gracious with our tone um because we know this is a hard process this is not something listen this is not something that you go through in a week two three four weeks like i said it was took me three years to go through the king james only mindset there are some issues that we're going to go through that's going to take a longer period of time this is not something that happens overnight it is a process and being understanding that process you may have been just out of the ifb for six eight months there's still a lot you're going to go through there's still a lot you're going to hear that's going to trigger and it's going to make you upset and so i hope these things don't trigger or upset you um but god's word is going to be able to help us and heal us and uh so yeah don i'm, I'm done rambling no that was good stuff i like that i like that you clarified that too because i'm in total agreement total agreement with you and um you know, we, we're excited about the future of the RFP movement. You know, guys, Black Friday. Be looking for, for Black Friday from the RFP family, from the RFP network. And no, it is not a new Spider-Man trailer. Mm, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think it's that. Uh, but I really enjoyed that new trailer that came out anyways. Uh, but uh, please like, share. And subscribe to the podcast if you enjoyed this. Leave us a leave us a review on it if you want to uh, just blast us. You know you can leave a review too. We'll both read it, yeah, and right. we may share it on social media. Who knows? Never know. Anyways, uh, thanks everybody. We hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving and Merry Christmas, and we will see you in 2022. Until next time. Until 2022. To God, not the pastor. Be the glory. Thanks for listening to the For Freedom Podcast. To find more content like this, please visit rfpnetwork.org. To find more podcasts like this one, resources, and meetups to encourage you on your journey.